Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. I know it's been a really interesting afternoon so far, and we're excited to continue with a presentation from Prami Gupta, who is a doctoral candidate at the School of Social Ecology at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, so Prami, we'll turn it over to you for a presentation on We Want to See You Succeed, a non-antagonistic mode of activism. Thank you, Noah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I know it's late, so thank you for you know coming coming to the presentation. Uh, I'll I'll try to keep it um, quick and simple. Um, so my presentation is based on shareholder activism. Uh, I am specifically interested in studying investors who are value based investors and uh, investors who focus on ESG issues, and some of these investors might also be using uh, ESG criteria uh, for screening purposes and deciding on what companies to invest or not. And although like not all value-based investors will engage in shareholder activism or shareholder act, uh, advocacy, uh, by that I mean like they will actively engage with companies and push them and influence them to change some of their policies and practices. But uh, for the purpose of these, um, this study specifically, um, I will use the term uh, interchangeably. So when I mean, uh, when I say value-based uh, investors, uh, what I mean is that these are the investors who are motivated by ESG issues. They use ESG issues for their, um, uh, for their investment decision-making, and they also uh, actively engage in um, activism and communicate with uh, uh, corporations uh, and try to influence them. So in the recent years, uh, we have seen a rise in ESG-focused uh, shareholder activism, and these company and these investors claim that uh, companies uh, that manage their social and environmental impacts um, that do not manage their social and environmental impacts, they're exposed to business risk and companies that uh, do manage uh, these impacts and include these criteria, social and environmental criteria into their decision making, um, they, um, they are more successful in the long term and they outperform um, their peers. Uh, but the more we, you know, we get into understanding that now, first of all, the landscape of value-based uh, investors is quite uh, diverse. Um, and uh, you can have like big asset management firms who are also interested in ESG issues, but I'm uh, mostly interested in uh, understanding the smaller um, uh, shareholders. So shareholders who do not uh, own a whole lot of, um, they don't have uh, in a whole lot of uh, investments in the companies that um, they're engaging with. And these uh, shareholders, they tend to be, and tend to have less uh, power than the companies they uh, engage um, and uh, try to change. And um, there are different ways why I say that, you know, different reasons why I say that they, um, they have less power. The first of all is that one of the main challenges is the regulatory challenge that is associated with filing shareholder resolutions. So uh, within the United States, one of the main way, primary ways uh, shareholders can voice their opinions and influence companies is by filing shareholder resolutions. However, um, there are some limitations or restrictions by the SEC that makes this process difficult, especially when we are talking about ESG issues, so environmental, social, and governance issues. So the first one is uh, economic relevance exception. So if a shareholder resolution is bringing up an issue that um, the resolution doesn't really talk about, what is the financial um, take on it, or what is the business case for that issue, um, the company can challenge that resolution and, and apply for a no action. And they don't have to, to include that uh, resolution um, in their proxies. The other is called the ordinary business exception, which basically uh, prohibits um, investors into, into micromanaging uh, the company. And finally, uh, irrespective of the voting outcomes, these resolutions are not uh, legally binding. So a resolution can, can earn a very high amount of votes, 
but the company in no way is legally required uh, to implement that proposal. Um, the other kind of limitation that comes into play when we talk about ESG focused shareholder uh, activism is that, again, these investors own like very small amount of company shares, so divestment may not be, you know, a very effective way uh, of, uh, you know, uh, influencing a firm to change or putting pressure on the firm to change. And then Although in recent years, we have seen that big um, institutional investors like BlackRock and Vanguard have, have voted for some of these, voted in favor of uh, for some of these resolutions, still the, the amount of uh, these resolutions that receive these uh, support from uh, big institutional investors are, are quite small. So, um, but, Irrespective of these challenges, um, there have been cases, and these cases are increasing, that um, value-based investors have sustained and sustained and advanced their change agendas, and they have been able to, to push companies to adopt certain uh, policies and practices that, uh, that they have uh, recommended. Um, they have also provided inputs on, on how firms can do some of their social and environmental commitments, for example, uh, they have recommended outside auditors uh, or independent organizations that can conduct uh, human rights assessments for firms or do a uh, racial equity audit. Um, and, some, and, and there have been instances where corporate managements have publicly acknowledged um, the importance of, of value-based investors. So this led to this, you know, uh, me asking the question or me being, getting interested in the question is that how are these less powerful shareholders able to influence uh, more powerful uh, firms or why would firms care about this uh, less powerful uh, shareholders? So I started um, approaching, um, so I was, I'm interested in like five sub questions uh, under this umbrella question. So the first is, uh, what challenges do value-based uh, shareholders experience uh, in maintaining their change agendas? Uh, what tactics do these uh, shareholders adopt or do not adopt um, in overcoming the different challenges that I just you know, like spoke about earlier uh, that they encounter? Um, why do they uh, choose to, you know, or not choose to adopt the tactics, uh, certain tactics? Uh, what are the scope of these tactics in, in advancing their change agendas? And then, and uh, by scope, I'm also going to talk about some of the limitations of these strategies and how do these sh uh, shareholders can overcome uh, some of these uh, limitations. So this is a primarily a qualitative study. Um, the data collection for the study is still ongoing, but uh, so far um, the results that I'm going to present here is based on um, interviews. Uh, these are like in you know, a longitudinal semi-structural uh, interviews that I've conducted with various shareholder advocates from various organizations in the US. Um, these organizations include um, asset management firms and nonprofit organizations. Uh, I've also attended uh, various conferences and, and spoken with uh, the shareholder advocates and the activists who were in, in presence there, and um, also some of the other uh, data collection methodologies include um, observations and, and some uh, participations, which is, which is ongoing. So my finding so far has been that shareholders, they um, they situate themselves as expert allies uh, of the firms. So the expert is that they situate themselves as people who are knowledgeable about ESG issues. They understand what ESG issues are and they understand how ESG issues can impact uh, corporate operations. And the allies is that they, they situate themselves as people who are actors who want firms uh, and companies to succeed uh, financially. Um, there are different strategies that they use to, to situate themselves as uh, uh, expert allies. Um, the, before I get into the strategies, I, I want to say that, you know, like, I, 
by by this slide, I don't mean that every shareholder uh, advocacy organization that is out there is going to implement all of these strategies. But from my um, uh, data collection and data analysis so far, uh, what I've come to understand is that the organizations will, will have been um, adopting and implementing some combination uh, of these strategies. So, so that's just something that I want to point out. Um, so the first one is that they distinguish themselves from the actors that firms consider um, as their adversaries. Uh, they tend not to name and shame the firms they target. Um, instead, they will publicly uh, praise the firms for their ESG uh, efforts. They will share knowledge uh, with corporate actors. Um, they will always support their claims with their reputable uh, data sources. They will focus on making the business case and they will adopt an um, incremental approach uh, to change. Now, because of limited time, I'm not gonna go into like, you know, like a very detail on, uh, on every detail of these strategies, but um, what I want to, um, uh, but I, but I want to, uh, what, but what I will do is that I'm going to share some uh, quotes uh, from my interviewees uh, that I feel kind of like capture um, the essence uh, of these strategies. So the first one, uh, distinguishing from corporate adversaries. So um, it says that we told the company that we are, um, we as an institution want to see you succeed. This is a very different perspective from what the protesters had. They would be fine if the company would have burned down to the ground. There is a kind of campaign style activism. Ours is a trust building, relationship building, long-term engagement with the company to help um, and encourage them to move forward in a more um, sustainable direction. Um, another um, inter um, another value-based investors uh, said that um, there are two different communities of shareholder activists. We are interested in environmental and social issues and in good governance. And we are not the folks who call themselves shareholder activists, but who are really just trying to gain uh, control of a board. So there is a you know, and uh, like a, a, um, the, the, both these codes are are very directly um, distinguishing uh, the the different types of actors that uh, that target companies or or ask them or push them to change. The next is uh, no naming and shaming. So the social movement literature have identified the naming and shaming strategy as something that activist groups um, frequently engage in. And what it means is that they publicly condemn the companies they target. And uh, this strategy works by garnering uh, media attention and it also questions the firm's uh, reputation and legitimacy, social legitimacy. Most value-based investors that I've uh, you know, come across um, during my research, uh, they tend to move away from the strategy. Instead, they focus on positive relationship building. They focus on having private dialogues uh, with the companies and um, they will file shareholder resolutions uh, only after private dialogues um, have failed to, to produce the kind of results um, that um, they are, they're looking for. Uh, the third is uh, sharing knowledge. So um, here, here is a code, it says, companies, even though they have a lot of resources, they are not likely capable of being experts on every ESG issue out there. Uh, we see our role as coming in and saying that we have become aware of this risk and are bringing it to your attention because you may not have seen this niche thing emerging and it is a risk for these reasons. And we believe that the company would benefit to take action on it now and be um, ahead of the curve. Uh, I have like multiple examples of this, but the one that I share here is, uh, we, uh, this is from another organization um, and, and the court says, we developed a business case about the cost of discrimination and replacing an employee. We told the firm that it is a hidden cost because if an employee leaves the organization for that reason, they're probably not going to tell you that. And you don't um, want to spend untold hundreds of thousands of dollars every year for rehiring for nothing. 
And we showed and really quantified for them that reputationally there was something at stake because you don't want to look bad on a benchmark like the corporate equality index. So what I've seen is that what I find that they do a lot of research um, on behalf of the company, even though they are, you know, like not hired or paid to do this research, but they, a lot of these organizations will have their own research teams um, and they do very elaborative research. They, they build a business case for issues and then they present those information and share those information um, with the companies. Um, the fourth is like they support their claims with reputable data. What I mean by that is that they are, they are very, I know there is a focus on citing um, sources, like for example, the New York Times, the Wall Street that are, that are you know, uh, widely uh, recognized. Um, and there is another quote over here that says, um, so this was a question that I said that, you know, do you always um, cite your data? And the, 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 the person I was interviewing said, well, I try. Um, uh, if not, uh, when I have an opinion, I say uh, that my opinion is based on this. I can point to my lived experiences in other areas. My opinion is just based on my opinion, but I try to be very clear about it. Either way, I absolutely do not want to lose credibility with the people I'm having conversation with and these people um, being in the corporate management. Um, the fifth is that by not losing credibility, it means that by focusing on uh, the business case. So there are, so the first, one of the people said, uh, what's important for us is to establish that we are representing investors, that we are not an NGO group that's coming in with a series of demands based on issues as opposed to real shareholder concerns. And this real shareholder concerns mean uh, financial issues the financial performance of the company. Um, and the second says um, the corporate world is very elitist and exclusive and believes organizations like Greenpeace don't understand how businesses work. So if you are coming in from a different worldview instead of their business systems, they will essentially say you don't understand how business works, how market works. Um, and um, if you do what you're asking us to do, uh, we will go out of business. So this is the credibility struggle that might um, emerge uh, during these interactions. And one of the ways uh, value-based investors overcome this struggle is by focusing on, on the business case of the, of the ESG issues that um, they're um, interested in discussing. And finally, is that they propose incremental change. So uh, one uh, investor explained uh, uh, businesses, uh, especially the large, uh, really large entities can't change on a dime. Uh, turning a big ship takes time. There are a lot of things that we uh, might not be thinking about that the company uh, needs to go out and figure out. So it takes time and resources and the process of change is iterative, is step by step, step by step. So they're considering a company's capabilities and limitations and in some um, in, in, in many instances, they will, they will uh, modify their ask of the company based on their conversations with the company and, how, and what they have learned about um, the limitations that the company is experiencing um, in, in implementing that change. Now, these strategies, uh, what I've found is that it helps generate uh, three types of resources uh, for these um, uh, value-based investors. So the first is relationships. So it helps them to generate trust and credibility among ESG uh, specialists and managements. Um, they can also, um, but through the, the process of, of uh, building this positive relationship with the sustainability team, uh, with companies, and then the sustainability team can influence the corporate management uh, to implement some of the, the changes that the investors are asking for. It also helps them to, gen, uh, to gain knowledge. Uh, this knowledge can include uh, technical knowledge. So for example, if um, the ask is related to some, uh, you know, for example, um, like ethical sourcing of materials, um, companies can uh, do have like supply chain complexities that they need to work with. 
So um, through this, these strategies and, and having these private dialogues, uh, investors gain this technical knowledge and can come up with ads that are more likely uh, to be implemented and adopted by, by companies than ads that, are, that um, the companies might just think are outrageous. And then it also helps them to gain knowledge about um, the normative, uh, normative knowledge, which is about like how firms uh, make uh, make decisions. Who are the key players um, inside a firm, um, and um, and just like the the general decision making processes uh, of a firm. The third resource it helps is like informal authority. So, for example, like firms will um, after the trust and the credibility is established, firms might reach out to these investors and ask their opinion. Uh, or suggestions about, you know, what uh, organizations they can partner with uh, to conduct a human rights assessment or a racial equity audit, um, or they might reach out and, and you know, like, and, and um, investors can give them uh, uh, comments on, on how, what could be the, the wording of, of a policy, an ESG-related policy that, that they have agreed uh, to adopt. Now, these findings, they, they support uh, theories of frame resonance, which is a very popular theory within the social movement literature. And the theory of frame resonance says that, um, that to the extent to which an activist framing of an issue uh, resonate uh, with the, the target audience, the more it resonate, um, the more it, is, it would be successful in, in changing the target audience. So in this case, the target audience are corporate management and um, companies, as we know, they're interested in, in uh, you know, um, in, in making profits and limiting their risks, financial risk. So the more uh, value-based investors are able to frame their ESG issues in terms of uh, uh, making uh, profit and limiting uh, financial risk, the more it will be um, uh, companies would, uh, would be willing to, to adopt those, um, those policies and practices. It also um, supports the literature on issue selling and uh, not ad uh, and uh, upward influencing. And so the literature on issue selling also talks about like um, the, to the extent that issues are presented to corporate management um, as strategically important and beneficial for the company, uh, they are likely to gain managerial attention um, and, and support. Uh, the identity of the issue sellers also play a critical role. Um, so the more uh, corporate management and corporate actors find investors uh, trustworthy, uh, credible, and having the best interest of the firm, uh, they would be more successful um, in influencing the company to adopt um, their proposed changes. But there are limitations of this um, uh, you know, expert allies approach. So the first limitation is that this requires the investors to operate within the profit-making um, ideological boundaries of corporate management, and it prohibits them from raising ESG issues that do not have an established business case, or they need to go and develop a business case for which the research or the data uh, might not be present. The second is the naming and the shaming tactic. It works by creating reputational risk for firms. And therefore, when um, investors do not engage in, in these kind of tactics, um, they're also not uh, raising issues that do not, um, that are associated with the firm's uh, reputational concerns. And the third is that the incremental approach uh, hinders uh, investors from raising or, or asking for change that requires that uh, requires ample investment of resources from from a corporation, and, and changes that the company cannot um, implement readily. And what it does is that um, it stops um, investors from asking uh, for changes that uh, that might be required for time sensitive issues um, like the climate change. So taken together. Uh, what this strategy does is like, although it, 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 um, it helps uh, investors generate those, those um, uh, resources 
and, um, and engage in a continuous process of change, uh, it also in, in introduces uh, conservative bias in the, in the shareholder activism uh, discourse. Um, there are some organizations uh, that actively uh, work towards overcoming uh, these uh, limitations. And so this uh, you know, uh, brought up new, new research question for the study. And the questions were, uh, are um, how do value-based investors attempt to overcome the uh, conservative bias? And to what extent uh, these attempts are successful and uh, what does success, being successful mean? And, and this, this part of the research is ongoing, but what I have found so far is that um, this attempt to overcome conservative bias uh, uh, includes uh, creating a combination of a top-down and bottom-up approach of change. And so if you think about uh, shareholder activism as a top-down uh, approach to change, a bottom-up approach would be uh, uh, the kind of change uh, attempts done by grassroots organizations, including uh, labor unions or environmental um, activism groups. So there are some organizations um, and who engage in shareholder activism, but also um, develop uh, strategic partnerships uh, with grassroots organizations and non-shareholder um, activism organizations. And through developing those relationships and combining a top-down and bottom-up approach of change is, um, is how they tend to overcome or attempt to overcome the conservative um, bias that, that is introduced. Um, this, is, um, this is an ongoing research. Um, I will have more to, more to um, to share, um, how, share about the strategies and, and the outcomes um, in, you know, hopefully sometime in the new, near future. Um, potential contribution uh, of the study. Um, this, the, the main goal of the study is to understand, like, you know, to what are the mechanisms of, of uh, value-based uh, shareholder activism and what is the scope, uh, scope of this activism. It, 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 uh, the study very much takes a processual view, a processual understanding um, of shareholder activism. It also identifies and examines uh, alliance building as, a, as an activism as a, uh, strategy. And uh, the social movement literature and the organizational change literature, when we talk about activism, it is very much focused on tactics such as like, uh, you know, like boycotts and protests. Uh, but the study, um, um, I'm interested in understanding like how, how positive relationship building uh, could be helpful in, in influencing uh, corporate decision making. And what are the limitations uh, of this strategy? And finally, um, it explores uh, the issue selling mechanism uh, in an interorganizational context rather than an, an organized within organizational context. So, the issue selling literature has mostly focused on how um, socially and environmentally uh, motivated employees uh, would. Uh, sell, you know, like, like sell their issues, like um, what, what it basically means is that influence managers to adopt some changes. Uh, in this case, we are interested in an interorganizational context where uh, shareholders are like less powerful shareholders are, are selling their uh, issues to, to, to more powerful, um, powerful firms. So I think that was, uh, that's all what I have to share uh, right now. Uh, I'm very much interested in, uh, you know, in, in, um, in uh, the questions. Thank you so much, Prami. Uh, opening it up to questions, that was a really great presentation. Uh, seeing something from Elsie. Yes, exactly. A brilliant insight into an otherwise unexamined lever in the ecosystem of influence. Absolutely. Thank you, Elsie. Um, feel free to enter other questions in the chat. Oh, here we go. Uh, hello, Prami. In your work, have you asked about the corporation's hiring practices and retention policies, specifically regarding our formerly incarcerated? Um, have you asked if this is a concern or interest of the share shareholders? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Paul, for the question. Yeah, so my, um, the, I have not specifically asked for this question, um, but it is an ongoing uh, understanding of like how investors uh, pick up issues. Uh, from what I've understood is that if there is an ongoing, you know, like uh, if if, the, if an issue comes in to become a part of the uh, the common domain of um, conversation, then it will become an an an, an issue for um, for the, the the shareholder activists. So, for example, uh, after the death of uh, George Floyd, uh, we have seen an increase. Um, in uh, shareholder resolutions uh, based on uh, uh, racial discrimination. So, so if th th that's that's all, all, all I have, um, I don't know if that uh, answers your question. There's a follow up question on. So, how do we get it to be part of the common domain? Yeah, so I, I I think like that's where it becomes the the combination of the top down and bottom up approach. Uh, so we the the top uh, the bottom up would be like you know you have uh, different NGOs and local community groups and uh, um, interest groups who are who are trying to bring uh, these issues and and you know helping them and, and pushing these issues to become a part of the the public domain and the public discourse, and then you have the investment investors um, who are, you know, if you think about it as the, the, the top-down approach, who are bringing this, you know, like picking up on this issue, then taking it to the to the corporate management and, and using their uh, ownership rights um, to, to bring these issues to, to the boardrooms. What about, um, do you see overlaps in this activist investor activity and emergent practice areas in general management consulting. Yeah, I, I did this have like, you know, attracted my attention. I don't have a whole lot of insight on this, but I, I do understand that there are uh, some of the, the, the uh, consultancy companies who have now, you know, like brought up this, um, this uh, channel, like, you know, providing services for companies to uh, to work around uh, shareholder activists. However, I have to, I you know like I, I think it, it could be a good and 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 not such a such a good thing because we really don't want some sort of like you know like greenwashing or woke washing when it comes to to these kind of of issues. And um, so I, I I would you know like like the the mat the ma it, it really depends on like you know like the management companies there are some management companies that that are taking more of a um, sincere approach to these issues and there could be management companies where um, they, they might be motivated with you know they might have different ob objectives. Yes, uh, Elsie. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, put my my email in the in the chat box and uh, love to um, connect with um, with you and, and anyone else in the in the audience. Again, like uh, as I mentioned, that that this research is very much ongoing. So um, hopefully, you know, like the the questions generated here is very helpful to kind of understand, like you know, what what we might be looking uh, into. Um, to gain further insights into this phenomenon. Thank you so much again, Prami. It was a really interesting presentation and we're grateful for your participation. Uh, we'll take a 10 minute break before joining back at 4 p.m. for a, um, I believe it's the garbage, the garbage of ESG data and we're taking garbage literally. So definitely one to stick around for. Uh, please join us then and, and thank you again, Prami, for your time. Thank you. <laughs>